Welcome back to this study of General Biblical Introduction. In the first session, you will remember that we were defining inspiration, the divine inspiration of God's Word, the divine inspiration of God's book. And we insisted that it was a verbal inspiration, words given. It's plenarily inspired. Every word is inspired. 2 Timothy 3.16. And then it is inerrant. There is no error anywhere in the text in terms of the original writing. Verbally, plenarily, inerrantly inspired. And then we insisted that that meant that what we're reading in the Bible is authority, a standard. If the Bible came from the mind of God, and it did, and if it is verbally, plenarily, inerrantly given, then it is God's mind, and there is no more absolute standard than God's mind. His nature is pure and holy. He cannot lie. And so we have an absolute standard called Holy Writ, Revelation. The product of inspiration is Revelation. The process of giving the Bible is called revealing, but the end product is revelation. So when you use the noun revelation, you have the end product of inspiration. But the process itself is a revealing one. And Bible students know that God did not reveal His scheme of redemption all at once. That there were three dispensations of mankind that received revelation as God intended to give it. There was a, a time when God spoke directly to the head of a tribe or the head of a clan, the patriarchal system. Abram, for instance, was a patriarch, as were Joseph and Isaac and Jacob and so on, and the sons of Jacob, well, including Joseph. So those are patriarchs. That was a time when God spoke to them through the head of the tribe. Then we had a time when God spoke through Moses and the priesthood of Aaron. That's called the Mosaic period. And during that period, the animal sacrifice kept reminding those people of their sin. But the Christ came in the Christian era. Now we have a perfect sacrifice. We can be justified completely in Him in the legal sense. We are made the righteousness of God in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And so we know there are three periods of time. And what we know is that throughout those times, God spoke. The book I'm holding up here is called The Book God Breathed. I mentioned it in the first session. I want to mention it again. This is a three-volume study of inspiration and inspiration is the topic that's going to be on this first series of tapings. And then we're going to do a series on canonicity, which books belong in the Bible. Then we're going to study textual criticism in another set of tapings. So we're going to have three sessions, inspiration, canonicity, textual criticism. Why? Because that is the basis for the study of general biblical introduction. We're not studying about the date of the book, or who wrote it, or what occasioned it, or what are the problems. That's special introduction. And all of those kinds of things are usually done before we ever study a book. But this is general. The things that preceded the very writing of the Bible itself, one of which is inspiration. And we come today to Hebrews 1.1. God. Oh, doesn't that imply something? Who at sundry times and diverse manners, spoken times passed unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. I wonder where we could find those speeches of his Son in Holy Writ. 
I get amazed that people who pronounce on God or pronounce on Christ or give out their opinion about this and that and the other thing, and they have no reference at all from the Bible. They don't even know about Jesus except for the Bible. And yet they make all these pronouncements. The illogicalness, illogicalness of that is amazing to me. But the Bible says God spoke. That implies something. It implies the existence of a being who both loves his created ones and intends to communicate with them. God spoke. Suppose he had remained silent as the deist says he does. Now we defined what a deist was in the last session. This fellow believes the world was created and then didn't do anything else. He just turned his back on it, so to speak. Well, that's not the case. God intends for us to have fellowship with him. Listen to John as he describes his encounters with Jesus. You'll have to go to the letter called 1 John, not the Gospel according to John. And you'll have to read with me from the very first verse of 1 John. All right? 1 John 1.1 1, 1. That which was from the beginning, that life is what he means, but that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, John says, I heard him speak. God spoke. And in these last days spoke unto us by his Son, I heard him speak, John says. I heard him. Which we have seen with our eyes. I saw him. He wasn't a phantom, as the Gnostics were trying to say in John's day. He was real. It was God in the flesh. I saw him. But he did more than that. Not only did he hear him and see him, John says, which we have looked upon. I studied him. I looked at this being and I studied him. He walked around with him for three years, a little more than three years. And then he said, I touched him. Uh -huh. I heard him. I saw him. I studied him and I touched him. He's real. He was a real human being in that body, but he was God in that body. For the life was made known. Oh, he saw all of his miracles. Even the old Pharisee Nicodemus said, we know you came from God because nobody can do what you do if he doesn't come from God. John 3, 1. He said, and John writes, for the life was made known, manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and I'm telling you, I heard him, I saw him, I studied him, and I touched him, he's real. And so I show unto you that eternal life. What did you learn from studying the physical form of Jesus and listening to him and watching him, John? What did you learn? He's life eternal. Didn't he say, I am the resurrection and the life? Though we're a man dead, yet shall he live. And that which we have seen and heard, John says, declare we unto you. How are you going to know anything about Jesus if God doesn't speak to us? John, what did you do for a living? I'm a fisherman. Oh. What university did you go? Oh, I didn't go to university. How do you know to write such magnificent words then? <laughs> Inspiration, key. God's telling me what to write. Oh. Using your vocabulary, yeah. You stand amazed in the presence of Jesus, don't you, John? Yes. Because that eternal life which was with the Father. He, when he was with Jesus, he learned he had been, that Jesus had been existing forever. That's why John could write, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. John 1.1. 1, 1. So he says that, oh, I'm so glad John did this. He said, that which we have seen and heard, we're telling you. Aren't you glad? That you... Keith, included in the you there, plural you, so everybody to whom he wrote, and I'm reading it, can be included in that statement that you also may have fellowship with us. John says, I can have fellowship with the apostles. 
Oh, boy. Those guys that walked around with him for three years, I'm in fellowship with them. And truly, he says, our fellowship is with the Father. Now he's telling me, I have fellowship with the apostles. Therefore, I have fellowship with the Father. Jesus said it this way. He that hears you, apostles, hears me. He that hears me, hears the Father that sent me. Luke 10, 16. And not only do I have fellowship with the Son when I hear what John wrote and what he wrote he had seen and heard and studied and touched. I have fellowship with his son Jesus Christ and watch what John says. And these things write we unto you. No mystery here. No special touching of the Holy Spirit here. I wrote these things that your joy may be full. 1 John 1, 1 for 4. God spoke. God spoke. And two things are implied. When I insist, as the Hebrews writer did, God spoke. First of all, that means that God is. And second, that He wants to talk to me. <laughs> he wants to communicate with me. Not directly. These things wrote I unto you that your joy may be full. God is, and He desires to communicate. In my mind exist any number of things that can resist any new information that I get. This particular problem is called cognitive recognizing. Dissonance, too much going on in my head. Too much dissonance, too much noise. And here comes this information, and I wrote it to you, John says. Wait a minute, let me digest that. Things are bouncing around in here. I've got all these beliefs. I've got all these goals. I've got all these attitudes. Um, I really don't believe in the supernatural. Oh. I wonder where that Bible originated then. Hmm. Changed my life. Hereby do we know that we know Him. If we keep His commandments, 1 John 2, 3. I obeyed something when I got baptized into Christ for the remission of my sins, Acts 2, 38. Did I obey a non-existent being? Hmm. Makes me rather stupid, doesn't it? Hmm. And John said, I saw Him and, and I touched Him and I heard Him and I studied Him and I'm writing to you. Well... Uh, I just don't believe it. Oh, now you've eliminated the term supernatural. You just don't want to believe it. You see, what's going on in my mind, past belief systems, some goal I may have, something to avoid interference from God in my life, whatever that is, that's cognitive dissonance. And everybody I know goes through that process when new information comes. My students do it. I, when, the reason we give tests at the Memphis School of Preaching is to find out what the student decided to remember. Because we know exactly what's going on when all this information comes. I resist it. And the idea that God spoke is resisted. And it's amazing that in this country, the United States of America, on the coin saying, in God we trust, has a multitude of people now who say, well, I'm not a Christian, but I'm spiritual. Cognitive dissonance. You can't be spiritual without being a Christian. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life, John 6, 63. You can't be spiritual if you're not following what Jesus said. And how do I know what Jesus said? John said, I wrote it to you. God spoke. Not only do I have this problem of all of my goals and ideas and belief systems in my head, whenever information comes to me, I expose myself to it selectively. 
I make the decision as to what I'm going to hear and what I'm not going to hear. Everybody does that. And I can only accept, really, what my background allows me to accept. That's why we don't start someone out in calculus in math class. We start him out one plus one is two. That means that all truth is only given to us a part of the time. At any given moment, because I'm selectively exposing myself to it piece by piece. And because there is that noise in my head and the fact that I will be selective about what I expose myself to mentally, something happens in my mind called selective perception. I can't understand what I'm not able to accept. <laughs> I cannot understand what I'm not able to accept. Therefore, God is, is hard to prove. Why? Because to prove the existence of God involves my intellect, dissonance going on there. It involves my will. Well, I don't want to expose myself to that thought because it would interfere with what I, my goal is to have fun. And my emotion. I don't like what you said, Keith, and besides, you're judging me. Oh. It is not biblical faith, however, to accept blindly the existence of God. If you have some interest in knowing that He exists, I can help you. If you have some interest in being willing to give your will to the God of heaven, I can help you. If you won't resist truth when you hear it, I can help you. Why? Because every message from God needs to be validated by the person hearing it. What? You have to show some interest in wanting to know it. I want you to open your Bible, your New Testament, your New Covenant portion, to Matthew chapter 13, 13 through 15. Jesus was teaching in parables and He was asked, why do you do that? Why don't you just come out plainly and say, I'm God in the flesh and... Well, He does on occasion. But watch what He said was the reason for teaching in parables. He said, therefore, speak out of them in parables because they seeing see not. They don't really have any desire to know the truth. Hearing they hear not. Well, they heard these words. Neither do they understand why. They're engaging in selective exposure and selective perception. They don't want to know it. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand. <laughs> Seeing ye shall see and shall not, here's your word, perceive. For this people's heart, its mind, is full of grossness. There's so much going on in their minds that they don't want to hear God. And their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes they are closed. This is deliberate. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Should understand with their minds and should be converted and I should heal them. Now, question. God spoke. Does that stir anything in you? Does it make you want to know what he said? Or are you saying, I don't have time for that. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to see that. Besides, it would interfere with my life and my goals. And, and besides, my father was this faith and I'm going to be that until I die. I don't care what the New Testament says. I don't want to hear that. Well... Therefore, speak out of them in parables because they don't have an interest. And if you don't have an interest in the truth, nobody can help you. 
Because he that wills to do the will shall know of the teaching, whether it be from God or God spoke of himself. John 7, 17. If you really want to know, I want to introduce you to a man named Thomas who really wanted to know. <laughs> oh, he wanted the evidence. Thomas, Jesus walked out of the tomb. I don't believe it. And I won't believe it until I see the nail prints in his hands and the hole in his side and put my finger into the nail prints and my hand into the side. I'm not going to believe it except I shall see the hands in his hands, the print of the nails, put my finger in his, the print of the nails, thrust my hand into his side. I will not believe. And the multitude, that's John chapter 20, verse 25. And a multitude of commentators are called Thomas, doubting Thomas. I don't hear a doubt there. What I hear is, I want the evidence. He's interested, all right. He's asking for the evidence. Did he get it? Well, he wasn't there this particular weekend, but the next Sabbath, or the next first day of the week, he showed up and there was Jesus. And Jesus said, Thomas, reach out your finger. Behold my hands. Go ahead, Thomas, touch it. And I don't know if he ever did. And reach hither thy hand and put it into my side and be not faithless, but believe. Here is the evidence, Thomas, John 20, verse 27. You would think if we had the attitude some have about his being a doubter, Jesus rebuked him for his doubts. He didn't. He showed him the evidence. Thomas' interest mentally was such that when he saw the evidence, oh, he said, my Lord and my God. John 20, 28. Faith that there is a God is based on reliable, valid evidence. It is not based on some blind emotional response to some message. If you will memorize the 11th chapter of Hebrews, <laughs> you'll find out that every one of those mentioned in Faith Hall of Fame were responding to the message and nothing else. By faith, Abel, how do you get faith? Word of God. Hebrews 11.4. Now, in our Bibles, we're told God spoke. Have you got any interest in that? <laughs> the Bible doesn't set forth a formal argument for the existence of God. That by that, I mean a syllogism. Major premise, minor premise, conclusion. Conclusion drawn from the evidence of the major and minor premise. We don't have that kind of thing in the Bible. But there is reference after reference to the evidence for deity's existence. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Psalm 19, 1. The world and its events reveal a supernatural intelligence. Romans 1, 20. Paul said, many of the nations were permitted to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he, God, left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food, filling our hearts with food and gladness, Acts 14, 17. The most, most fundamental of all biblical assertions is God is is. Everything else is secret, secondary. God spoke. And yet, the science books in our grade schools and high schools and colleges today teach that all that you can see is an accident. It just sort of grew. It evolved. Uh, could you tell me then why the 
earth is running down. <laughs> Your second law of thermodynamics denies evolution, but they don't let their own science deny what they want to believe, you see, what they want to believe. Well, you see, Keith, there was this primordial soup-like and a one-cell thing floating around it. Oh, really? Where did that originate? Well, we... I sit around sometimes and I just go, hmm, huh. One-celled thing in a primordial soup, yeah. He got out, yeah. Crawled around on the ground for millenniums until he developed legs. Uh -huh. and then he climbed up in a tree and one day decided to get the worm out of the tree by hitting it with his bill. I don't know where the bill came from or the worm in the tree, but that's what happened. And for centuries or millenniums or millions of years, he jumped out of that tree and tried to learn how to fly. Mm. That's what they say. I mm. wonder why he got out of the soup in the first place. Ambitious mother-in-law? Do they teach this for fact? Such nonsense? You know, a, a woodpecker, and there are three different kinds of woodpeckers that come to our feeders in the backyard. They're wonderful to watch. But he has in his head an hydraulic system, so to speak, a shock absorber. And every time he hits something with his beak, he doesn't feel it. Now, can you imagine that thing crawling up in that tree and for millions of years hitting it with his beak without that shock absorber system? But when you don't want to know the truth, you can think up some fanciful stories. The ancients used to say that Atlas held up the world and Atlas was riding on the back of a great big tortoise. Wow. They had nonsensical scientists back then too, did they not? Man's origination of the idea of God is a source of evidence. Yeah. There are multiple ideas about God in the ancient writings from Earth people. Atlas riding on the back of a turtle. <laughs> Some of those ideas are hazy, imperfect. The Bible says we have an a perfect, absolute, infinite personality who is the primary cause of all that exists. Okay, where in the world did man get that idea? That needs to be explained for those who are interested in knowing the answer. Because when I know the answer, I'm overwhelmed with the evidence for God. How did the first man ever think up a divine, absolute, infinite personality when all the other writings by men don't have anything nearly that descriptive? How did that happen? Well, you see, Keith, man's concept of a higher power came from the resonant forces in the universe. Well, wait a minute. People who believe in God's power are the resident forces. Worship the sun, not God. Sun God worships all over the ancient world. And what I want to know is who caused the resident forces. See, that's the primary question. Not, it's here. Who caused it? Well, you had a ball that exploded. Who caused the ball? Where did that dirt come? In its source. I was in a store several months ago and this lady did a favor for me and I said, God bless you. She said, don't bring that name up to me. I said, ma'am, it's interesting what you said, but it tells me you have a problem with logic. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, you believe in eternal dirt. I believe in eternal mind. Which was first, my friend? Mind or dirt? If the idea of God, a pure, absolute, infinite spirit, a perfect being arose 
from a non-spirit source, then we have everything in that statement that is anti-science. Because science says something cannot come from nothing. The only alternative, the only answer, if we are interested, is that man's concept of God came from an outside source, a revelation. God spoke, or man knows absolutely nothing about him. Impossible. When we study logic, we learn that there's always a beginning point and an ending. There's always an A to a Z. <laughs> I begin with God. Anything else is illogical. An eternal universe with no beginning? Try to imagine that. Try to tell me how that happened. Unless your mind is filled with pseudo-scientific information about some evolutionary thing. You know there isn't one fossil evidence of a crossover species anywhere in the world. Never happened. What's the claim? What's the distance? What's the perception? What's the selective exposure? What is it they won't let our young people see, why do they have to insist that only this doctrine be taught in the school? What are they afraid of? I challenge them with being non-intellectual. It is an unswerving law of logic that we start with a fact and reason from the fact to the conclusion, not the other way around. If it is a fact that the universe began from senseless matter, if that's the fact, then only mindless matter could ever be produced. That's science. Something cannot come from nothing. But there is an ordered world, a designed world, a cosmos. And since there is a cosmos, there must be a cosmos causer. There's order, not mindlessness. There's design that demands a designer. Mathematically, the evidence for God is overwhelming. Look to arithmetic or literature or even matter. 112 elements. Literature, 26 letters. Numbers, 1 to 10 with an ought. But with all of those, with those numbers, you can put all those combinations together for a mathematical solution, just from those 10 numbers. English literature, you only need 26 letters. And how do you find those combinations? Or do you find it by accident, or do you know there's a design there when you're working math? Do you find your sentence by accident, or do you know there's a design there? when you're writing your literature. When you see all those elements, hundred and one, well, there's a few more now. The chance that the, that the universe happened as an accident from those 112 elements is as remote as an explosion in a, in a print shop producing a book. Nature's not a blind force. It's a force directed by intelligence. There is sufficient evidence then for the God who spoke. But why did he speak? He is. But why did he speak? Hmm. I thought about that and so I found at least four biblical reasons. Maybe there are others. Maybe in your study you can find some. But why did God speak? He really, it really could be said He didn't need us. So why did He create us? 
Well, for His good pleasure, Revelation 4.11. He enjoyed that. And when I think about for His good pleasure, I think, well, if He's there and he's, he's, there's just three beings and there's no one else, no one else will ever know about Him. <laughs> and I wonder sometimes if He didn't create the angels and man so that there would be some who knew He existed. Because He did. And that is a thought that just destroys my thought process. He, he never had a beginning. Uh, he's just there. It has to be that, or we can't account for this place we call Earth. It's, no, it's not possible. But He spoke. That God who could say, tree, and there's a tree. He could say, sun, and there's a sun. That God spoke to us. The God. Spoke to us. Why? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God's love caused Him to speak. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one dare to die yet per adventure for a good man. Someone even dare to, would dare to die. But God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's hard for me to fathom. That happens to be Romans 5, 6, 3. But it's hard for me to fathom that kind of love. God loved Keith, me. He loved my wife who's sitting over here taking notes on this lecture. God loved us before we ever became Christians, as much as He's ever going to love us. That's an amazing statement about His love. And so He spoke. When I love someone, I talk to them, don't you? Human beings might die for someone they had some care or respect for, but not for an enemy. But he did. God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. God loved us so much. And that love extends to all men. That you may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven, for He maketh His Son to rise on the evil and on the good. Sunlight's for everybody. <laughs> and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. Rain's for everybody, Matthew 5, 45. God loves His creation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. 1 Timothy 4.10 God just is love. And He spoke. Some have said to me, Well, Keith, are you saying that an all-powerful God needed man? No. But He desired to love and have it in return. He made us in His image for that reason, so that we could be loving in return. The problem is, we, he, in order for us to be loving, <laughs> He had to make us with a, the ability to choose to love, because love without choice is not love. And when you give a being free will you, to choose, and you want Him to choose you, he may choose someone else, and man has done that forever. I believe God met, took a chance on man. Man rejected God. But God's love provided for the rejection. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. With the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who was verily foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was made known in these last times for us, who by Him do believe in God that raised Him up from the dead and gave Him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. God spoke. 1 Peter 1, 19-21. Man was created, dignified. And because man created us in a dignified manner, with the essence of dignity, He spoke to us. He loved us, but He has also created us with dignity. 
for thou hast made him, man, a little lower than the angels. Come here, lower, down here, on this earth. Not lower in character, but lower in geographical sense. You put him down here, a little bit lower, ma'av, a, 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 a place that's a little bit lower than heaven. But you crowned him with glory. Amar crowned him. You dignified him. That's exactly what Amar means. You made him an ornament. You dignified with glory. Kavad. Respectable. And honor. Hadar. Noble. When God created us, we were given a dignified respectable, noble essence. And as God recognizes that, or God recognized that in man's soul, made him that way. Before Adam sinned, he was crowned with glory and honor. He was dignified, noble, glorious. Well, Jesus took on that form. He too was crowned with glory and honor. That's not a reference to his being back in heaven. That's a reference to his nature in a man's body. He was a dignified, noble, glorified being. Well, given the fact that we are dignified beings, God spoke to us. Man is the highest of his creation. We're not animals. And so God spoke to us. When Adam lost that position because of his sin. God already had a plan in force one day to recreate that situation. And if you'll look at Ephesians 4.24 with me, you'll read this. And that ye put on the new man, now listen to Paul, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And without holiness, no man can see God. We have been given back in Christ the glory and dignity and honor that we had before Adam sinned. When I think about the fact that God looks at us as dignified, honorable, respectable beings, and therefore communicates with us, I wonder, have I always treated everyone with honor and respectability and dignity? It would change the way I think about every other human being if I thought about him as crowned with glory and honor in his original creation. And if he's a Christian, recreated in Christ, then I especially have the need to treat him with dignity and respectability and honor. My sisters in Christ need to think about what I'm saying here because they were the crowning achievement of God's creation. The last thing he created was a woman. <laughs> Put his best stuff in her. <laughs> How wonderful. And when we look at our mates and our spouses, dignity, respectability, honor. Giving honor as unto the weaker vessel. Paul, Peter told men, husbands, you give honor. Wouldn't it be a great world if we treated each other the way God does? He spoke to us, not only because he loved us, but he knew how he created us. We're to be dignified people, honorable people, respectable people, and to realize that that's the kind of person to whom God spoke. The one who is interested enough to ask, what must I do to be saved? Of course, so many aren't interested. Jesus lived crowned with glory and honor the whole time he was here. Hebrews 2.9. Why? He had to be that so he could taste death for every man. He was perfectly sinless, crowned with glory and honor. So he could taste death for every man. <laughs> Perfect man. And if I can make an effort to try to live like that, then I'm reaching for that dignity 
that nobility that God wanted me to have. That's what Christianity is, the noble life, the respectable life, the glorious life. And they'll see your good works <laughs> and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Adam lost his honor. But God can restore that in Christ. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being then made complete, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. All men would be upgraded, uplifted, if they would recognize God loves them and he spoke to you. And he wants you to wear the ornament of dignity. That's why he spoke. So you could be what you're supposed to be, not what you've been. And if you have that ability to treat each other with nobility, you're going to show the world something he wants the world to know. That you have love one for another so that the world may believe, Jesus said, that God sent him. John 17. 20 and 21 in John 13, 34, a new commandment give out you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you love one another. Oh, my friend, God spoke. And I don't know any other book, any other message that has that kind of power in it. To bring forth the love of God to a noble respectable, dignified being. I'm not an animal. I'm a human created to be dignified in the image of God. In the third place, God spoke to us because I need to know me. I didn't know what I am. And I certainly can't find it in a science book or a history book or a comic book. The ancient Greeks taught know yourself. Rene Descartes, the philosopher, came along and started saying, well, I don't know, what am I? Uh, I may not be that, I must be. And he began to think, oh, you know what, I'm doubting. But I can't doubt that I'm doubting. So ergo cognito sum, I think, therefore I am. Well, that philosopher did figure out he was. He actually existed. I remember in college sitting around with uh, a, a, a bunch of other untaught folks wondering, are we really here? Do we really exist? And all that kind of nonsense. A young man said to me one time, I'm trying to find myself. I said, look in the mirror. You're right there. But I do know this. I don't know anything about human beings without having the God of heaven speak to me about it. Why? Oh, Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It's not in me. I can't find me in me. I can't even direct my own steps. Jeremiah prayed. Jeremiah 10, 23. God made a dignified being when he created man. But that dignified, noble, honorable person still needs a directive, instruction on how to take advantage of being that created being. And that particular information is not in me because I didn't create me. But when we go around trying to say, I'm trying to find myself, we're running in opposition to what God told us to do. We don't work that way in a very wonderful way as human beings if we're always wondering, about who we are, and how am I going to find me, and what's important for my life. When I was being reared, I was in a denomination called Presbyterianism. And almost every Sunday, that 
preacher, and I'll call him that. He didn't call himself that. But that preacher would say, find God's will for your life. Oh, I was so troubled by that. Does God want me to be a carpenter, a lawyer, a chemist? What? What's God's will for my life? Who am I? And I go, I'm all confused. And all of that was because I was hearing the world's message, but not God's direction. God spoke because I can't know me correctly without His message. Many people settle for an existence that begins in the trauma of birth, endures the trouble of life, and ends in nothing. And so it's TGIF to them, and I don't even want to tell you what those words mean. Saturday's coming, I get away from the drudgery. How insane that life is. And without direction from God, that's what life is. Insanity. If there's no God, this whole thing is insane. I might as well eat, drink, and be married for tomorrow I die. And the head and us took that position. And the Stoics said, well, we'll just endure it. It's all insanity without instruction from God. Thou art worthy, O Lord. To receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, watch this, and for thy good pleasure they are and were created. When I do it right, according to his direction, I glorify him. I used to wonder about that. Why live the Christian life? Good life. Don't have to worry. In whatever state I am, there I can be content. Even when I'm in prison, where Paul was when he wrote that. I, I understand that. And, and if I have a problem, I just tell God about it, and the peace that passes understanding is mine. I got that. Good life. He blesses us. Takes care of us. When we come to the end of life's journey, as the songwriter said, we don't have to cross Jordan alone. When we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil. He's with us. All of that's great, but why do I need to do this since He saved me and I can't earn heaven? Hmm. Oh, but I was created for His glory. And when I go by His direction, something happens. Listen to Isaiah. For everyone that is created by my, is called by my name, I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him, Isaiah 43, 7. My friend, when I go by his directions, and he had to speak to give them to me, I not only have an honorable, dignified, respectable life, I glorify him. I give him honor. I honor my father. Common sense should tell me that the godless life is hollow. It has led to war, misery, chaos, murder, robbery, corruption, ad infinitum. Isn't it better to know that God spoke and directed me and he didn't tell me to know myself. And when Jesus said it the way it's supposed to be done, he went against every philosopher who's ever lived. Jesus said, uh-uh, you deny yourself. Keith, if you'll empty yourself of Keith, your life is going to be wonderful. You deny yourself, put yourself to death, take up your cross, and follow me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And in the last place, God spoke to us not only because He loved us and because of the way He created us and because we can't know ourselves without His direction, He spoke to us because we need to know something. I believe in God. What's His will for me? You remember what those preachers kept telling me? Find God's will for your life. Well, I know what it is. 
because by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all without the knowledge of God's will, that is, for my salvation, I can't go to heaven. That's His will. It doesn't matter if I'm a carpenter or a chemist. It doesn't matter if I'm sweeping floors or digging ditches or if I'm the world's greatest lawyer. Unless I obey His will, the will for me is lost. Then said Jesus to those Jews which followed Him, If you continue in my word, then you shall be my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The God of heaven spoke. Didn't stay away. Communicated. Because I need to know His truth, because it's only by His truth that I can be set apart in such a way that I can go to heaven. John 17, 17. There's a God in heaven who spoke to man so that man could relate to him, to each other, and live the life of contentment and eventually go to heaven. The very vocabulary of the writer was used to express that. So we have verbal, plenary, full, inerrant, no errors, inspiration that results in revelation, and that revelation comes from the God who is, who spoke to us because He loved us, directs us, wants us to know that direction, and wants us to know His will. Why did Jesus speak those parables? To hide for the truth from people who just didn't want to know it. God exists, my friend, and that shapes my life when I know that. Because His truth can take me apart from the world and send me into heaven. Do you want to know it? Study with us from the Word of God. Pick up a Bible and read it and find out what God's will is for your life. God bless you in your study of God's Word. Ever grow.